Okay everyone, Spuddy from Spuds Games. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today's video, we're going to be doing my latest pickups. Stay tuned. So first up, just want to say a massive thank you to everyone uh, over the last two months or so. I haven't had a chance to make another video. I think the last one I made was the, um, the screen shifter video. Uh, but since that video, my subscriptions have, have grown about 100. Um, you know, and I'm trying my best to answer all the comments that are coming regarding CRT modding, etc. Uh, but just to see how much the, just the subscription has, has grown uh, kind of blows me away because um, I didn't think there were that many people interested in this sort of stuff. So um, I'm now actually over 500 subscribers. So I just wanted to give a shout out to everyone who has subscribed. Um, a massive thank you. And I, I feel like I've let you down a little bit over the last few months because I haven't been able to make those consistent videos. And that's mainly because we've been doing a lot of internal work to the house uh, that I'm at now. I sold a house uh, over Christmas. I know that was a little while ago, but we had to move everything. Garage was a bit of a mess. And I did have some massive pickups that took up a lot of the garage space where I film a lot of my videos. And I just didn't have the room to do it. Um, but I've managed to clear a lot of it out now, so I'm, I do plan on getting uh, back and doing more videos. So today's video, what I'm going to be showing you, as I said before, is my latest pickups. It does span across about two months, so I've got a few PVMs. I think I managed to pick up three PVMs all up. Uh, I picked up a, an Amiga 500 and a 1084 bundle, uh, some big box PC games, um, as well as a massive TI99 slash 4A PC bundle, which is really really cool i've never used one before um, and i'll give you the whole backstory about how i managed to come across this find which was which was which was huge anyway let's get stuck into it what i'll do is i'll kick off with the amiga stuff first so here we are the amiga stuff there was actually more in this bundle than what i've got here uh, if i look over there was a floppy drive as well and a whole bunch of um of uh, floppy disks as well original games so not in their boxes just in a in a um a floppy disk case uh, or tray, but uh, they're over there in the collection at the moment. But the main uh, part of what I picked up was these two items, which I got really excited about. Uh, first one is obviously the Amiga 500. Everyone in Australia would know what an Amiga 500 is or who, who has dealt with old computers before. Um, boxed, always great when they're boxed. Um, this one does have, and I'll just try and open it up here. It does have, and I don't know if you can see that, but I'll just lift it up quickly does have its inserts now if I lift up that you know it has things like the bag over the the monitor uh, over the computer um, you know power supply all bagged up uh, mouse all bagged up doesn't have any manuals but uh, obviously being a collector over many years you do accumulate a lot of manuals so I will go through and populate what spare manuals I do have um, and I'll put it in this box um, just to try and get this one as much or complete as I can uh, so that was the first thing, a nice Amiga 500. Hardly any yellowing and the handle on the box. Small things for collectors, but um, yeah, it's really cool. The other one I've got, the big one, um, which I'm just looking up there, is the, the starter pack, which come with a heap of discs and whatnot. That has a, hasn't got this handle, so um, always nice to have those little things. Also, which I'm super excited about, everyone knows how much I love these monitors, a box 1084 monitor. So those who don't know what a 1084 monitor is, um, essentially badged under under Commodore and Amiga. Some were branded Amiga, some were just branded Commodore. 1084s, uh, tubes inside them are usually a Philips. There's also ones with Daewoo tubes in them. But the really cool thing about this uh, monitor does uh, 15 kilohertz analog and digital. So RGBS and CGA. Now I'm not gonna take this out of the box um, only because I know how hard it was to get back in the box, but I'll just lift it up here and you can see it's it's actually got the main bag, the foam, everything, even including the the bagged up original cables with it. So uh, these monitors are hard enough to find in the wild just on their own. You know, sometimes they've got broken doors or cracked, um, you know, housings on them. So to find one in excellent condition, boxed with the foam, all that sort of jazz, uh, really, really rare for me to find something like that. Uh, and this bundle itself was $300. So... You know, I think, I think I've done well out of this bundle and it's going to go straight in the collection. The, this box monitor will probably go upstairs into storage uh, because I do have a 1084 SP1 or SP2, I think it is over there, I already use. So I don't need another monitor in use uh, for anything. 
Uh, and this is the second Amiga 500 I've got. I always like to keep things I use a lot, try and keep two of, just because if one fails, you know, I'm not waiting on a repair before I can play it again. I can just plug another one in and away we go. Um, so next will be my backup Amiga 500. Uh, but all in all, uh, I was really happy with the price of this bundle and what was included. One thing I'll say quickly before I move off the Amiga bundle was an important thing uh, for those people who are looking to pick up an Amiga 500 or found one on Marketplace or Gumtree, always open the trap door underneath. So these had a, a little door underneath them. You could open up and there was a slot. You could plug, I think it was an extra 500k uh, memory into it, which changed it from an Amiga 500 um, to uh, essentially an Amiga 1 megabyte of, of uh, memory. So, but the issue with that is the original cards had batteries on them. You know, and when we're talking 25 plus year old batteries, they explode. Um, this one was lucky enough, it didn't have a Devata brand battery, it had another brand battery which weren't, um, I suppose, conducive to exploding as much as the Vata batteries, uh, but still wasn't taking the chance, pulled the old card out, cut the battery off it. Uh, I will replace the battery, but I put you can get more modern cards these days. Melbourne console repros, if you just Google that. Uh, they do a more modernized card that you can put in there. It doesn't have any batteries in it. So suggest open that trap door up. If it's got a card in there, an old card, pull it straight out. You'll probably find the battery's exploded. Um, if it hasn't exploded, it will explode. Uh, get it out, put the new one in, the more modern one in, uh, and you won't have any trouble. So that's just a little suggestion. If you are looking at collecting Omega 500 or you're looking at picking up a console, uh, always check that first. So next up on the list um, is the PVMs that I, I managed to pick up. Uh, there were three in total over the last uh, two months that I've managed to pick up. I've got one here on display, which I can show you guys. Um, I'm not going to go inside out, but I'll explain to you, you know, what, what, why I picked this up and what, what's wrong with it. Um, and there was two other monitors as well that I've picked up, and I'll throw some photos up so you can see what they are as well, because I did take some photos before they ended up at the repair shop. So uh, the one I've got in front of me, um, this is a uh, PVM 14, uh, what was the part of 14 N2A. Um, so these particular Sony PVMs wouldn't class as a high-end PVM. They do have a 500 TVL line count, which is good. Um, but when you open it up, you can see this is not the real high-end PVM that you'd normally associate with Sony. Um, what I've done some digging uh, around, what i found is these pretty much are... Uh, I suppose, an expensive security monitor. Um, there was two different models, the PVM series and the SSM series. Um, from what I can tell, uh, the model number on the back end of it, so the uh, N2A, uh, or is that what it was, N2A? The 14 N2A bit, that's the same whether it's an SSM or PVM at the start. SSM is their security monitor range, PVM is obviously their, uh, their graphics slash broadcast range of monitors. So but as far as I can tell, it seemed to be a kind of a marketing thing. They're pretty much exactly the same monitor. Uh, but this one had actually all three PVMs I picked up had issues, so I got them quite cheap. Um, this one powered on, gave me sound, uh, inputs changed, but there was no picture. Uh, so I opened it up, <laughs> you know, one of those things you open up and your heart sinks straight away. Uh, it had a broken neck board on it, which actually had been repaired. Now, it looked really dodgy, and I'll throw some photos up of what it looked like. Um, so straight away, I thought, there's no way in hell this monitor's going to work. But the repair looked quite old, and I'm thinking, okay, maybe this monitor was repaired, and it did work, and something else was wrong with it. So I did some digging, and straight away on the neck board, I noticed there was uh, a dodgy capacitor. And I think they refer to this as the screen capacitor. Um, I've seen it referred to somewhere else, and this is pretty common across most CRTs. There's a capacitor up on the neck board and electrolytic that's quite prone to failing. Um, and I pulled it out, it looked dodgy. Um, you could obviously, there was visible signs, it was leaking, it was bulging. Pulled it out, the ESR meter couldn't even read it properly. Um, it just gave me an ESR of greater than 50. And it, it actually gave me a capacitance value eventually, after a couple of goes, of about half of what it should have been. So, changed that. And lo and behold, once I changed that, I actually got picture. Um, so, uh, ori originally I thought there was no way it was going to work, but you know the fact that I got picture out of it just by changing that one capacitor was a win. Now unfortunately since then, um, and this is where I think the repair comes into it on the neck board, is it's gradually got worse and worse over time. And initially it was, it was out of focus, uh, brightness took a long time to come to fruition, um, or up to the correct levels, uh, even when I adjusted it. 
I could get it pretty right and then you know we had some colors dropping in and out and eventually now I've just got a plain red screen a really bright red screen so I think that repair in the neck board and me dicking around pulling components off and checking them I think that repair has finally had its had its day um, and things are starting to short things are starting to fail across the tracks um, and at the end of the day I'm not going to spend a heap of time trying to repair the neck board again these I'm going to face the facts these monitors are pretty common in Australia um, the neck board is the same across the composite monitor or the RGB version of it so I'm pretty confident over time um, that I can find a new neck board for it uh, and if I can't find a new neck board for it I'm pretty confident everything else on this thing works so if I do come across another one later on whether it's a speaker fail, some buttons broken, maybe the bezel on the front's all cracked up uh, whatever it is, maybe the flyback's blown, I know I've got a spare monitor here and the, well one of the most important thing is the tube works obviously so um, I'll keep this as a spare because it wasn't that expensive to start with I'm not going to spend a hell of a lot of time on this trying to repair it just because a broken neck board is, you know, you can repair them but in my experience once you do repair them yeah, it works okay for a while but then you just run into issue after issue as things start to break down, the epoxy starts to get old, it starts to conduct you just run into all sorts of problems and which is what I think's happened here so um, that's the first monitor that I picked up the second monitor which is in the repair shop at the moment um, was a, a PVM 2054QM which I've had one of these before uh, these are a great monitor um, and I've got a picture of it here on the back of my car when I picked it up uh, it works um, but what I found was the geometry was a bit wonky uh, I could actually set the geometry so it was okay, but what I found was if I turn it off for you know more than an hour or so, come back, the geometry had gone all wonky again. Uh, and what I found is as I without adjusting it, if I actually left the, the the monitor on, you could sit there and watch it, and the geometry would start coming back into into what I would expect the geometry to be. So um, there's obviously some capacitor issues there, or maybe an, an inductor issue, or there is a component or a couple of components starting to fail. I don't think it's anything major. Uh, it'll be capacitors or an inductor or something like that. If it was a diode, I would expect something hard and fast to have happened, um, whether it's no screen or, or something fixed to happen because you know a diode just doesn't usually fall out of spec. It's either, it's either not conductive or it's conductive, one or the other. So when it breaks down, usually goes open circuit, doesn't conduct either way, or sometimes it can conduct both ways. And whenever that happens, Usually the problem you face is a fixed problem. It's not a variable problem like wonky geometry that all of a sudden starts coming back to normal after a set period of time. So I've actually handed that off to uh, someone I found locally, a, an old, he's actually not old, he's, uh, he's still in the game. He repairs, he's a licensed repairer for Sony and Panasonic uh, broadcast, broadcast equipment. Been in the game for 30 odd years um, and obviously being in there for that long he used to repair PVMs and BVMs all the time. Had a quick chat to him, he was more than happy to take a look at it. He since phoned me up, said he found a couple of capacitors, he's going to change them, see how we go. The other good thing, he's going to do a full service on it. So he's going to set the geometry, he's going to set all the colours for RGB, he's still got all his old equipment. So he's going to do all that for me. It's not going to be free, obviously, but the time I would have spent, you know, the time I would have maybe got a Savon Pat kit in from the US to change all the capacitors, you know, this one had a sea of capacitors. Now, speaking to the guy, he doesn't reckon it had that many, but I looked inside and I'm like, wow, that's a lot of capacitors to change or even look at uh, trying to find out what the issue is. So he's going to do that for me. Um, and hopefully next week or the week after, I'll have that back and I'll do a full video on that. Um, it was, I think there are 600 TVL monitor being 20 inches, really ideal for playing video games on, especially in smaller rooms, uh, give a really good picture. So I'm really keen to get that one working. The other one that I picked up was a multi-format 14-inch uh, PVM. Once again, this one had issues too, similar but different issues to the 2054, uh, whereas you would turn it on, it would start out with a not in sync line across the screen, quite squished, and over time it would come into sync, the picture would come back to normal. So once again, no doubt there's a failing capacitor there or something failing on, on probably the deflection board that, uh, that is the issue probably a capacitor or a couple of capacitors. So I actually phoned old mate up again who was looking at the other one. He said, bring it in, he'll look after that one too. So once again, not free, but I'm comfortable and I'm glad that it's in the hands of someone who knows what they're talking about. I mean, I would normally have a go at it, but as I said, the time it's gonna take for me to find, diagnose the problem, change the problem, get the parts, pull it apart, put it back together, 
and the fact that he's got all the equipment to, to calibrate it again, uh, it's much better. I'd much better paying that money to him to do that than me trying to do it myself. Um, and if there's any issues with it, then obviously he can, um, you know, he, he basically said he'll, he'll look after it from there. So uh, once I get these two monitors back from him, then I will do a video on them separately, especially the, the multi-format. That's, that's, I'm really looking forward to having that. So that does 240p right up to, I think, 1080i, so 720p and 1080i. It um, has SDI input, has RGB input, um, has 15 kilohertz, uh, analog 15 kilohertz, digital. Um, so it, it does a whole range um, of formats. So, you know, I can use it as a, a really good test monitor. Uh, 14 inches for me is probably too small to play video games on, um, but as a test monitor, um, you know, I think it'd be, be really ideal. So once I get those two back, then I'll do a video on those as well. So next up, we've got big box games, PC games that I've managed to pick up over the last few months. So I have picked up a lot more than this, um, but these are probably the pick of the bunch that I've managed to grab. Um, these were all spread across two bundles. One was a big free bundle that people, that someone was giving away, uh, and the other one they were charging ten dollars each. So, um, for the hundred dollars that I spent um, buying the games that I wanted to buy and, and the games that were in the free bundle, uh, certainly for me a hundred dollars well spent. Um, so, first up, you know, games like you know, I grew up with these games, X-Wing. Um, I actually bought a joystick for that as well. Because I didn't have one, I went to play it, and then I remembered, geez, you need a joystick for it. So I've actually got one of the 3D Pro joysticks over there I bought. Got King's Quest, Quest for the Crown. Um, I do love a good Sierra game, so nice to have that in the collection. Um, we've got uh, Quake 2 as well. I actually had this already downloaded and copied, but uh, it's always nice to have the original now. Uh, big box version of Quake 2. Um, so that, that's a couple there. But then we've got some of the really good ones that I managed to grab as well. So most of these were $10 each. So we've got the Age of Empires Collector's Edition, which I think is Age of Empires 1 and 2 and all the expansion packs. Um, I, once again, I've got copies of those games over there, so it's really nice to have the genuine games uh, all nicely boxed. Uh, Baldur's Gate 2, um, what's it called? Shadows of AM or Um or however you want to pronounce it. Um, the, the big box version, it's, you know, complete, it's a really nice box, um, got all the manuals, maps, etc. inside, so nice to have a copy of that. Um, one of the most iconic games that I had when I was growing up, uh, the original Half-Life game, and to have it in the PC big box version is, um, is even better, so, um, I'll be going ahead and installing this. I've actually only picked these up in the last week or so, so this one, this one's relatively new. Um, then we've got... Another game that I absolutely loved when I was when I was younger, going through my Windows 98 days, Carmageddon, Carmageddon the original one, yeah, definitely, and Carmageddon 2. Um, you know, it's, I, I spent a heap of hours playing Carmageddon 2, so once again, really nice to have it now uh, in my possession. The original game, a big box. Another one, I didn't actually play too much of this growing up, but since I, you know, I, I showcased this on a couple of Facebook pages, and it was. Probably the game that got most comments was Lego Island. Uh, there was a hell of a lot of people that played this game, and a lot of people loved this game. So, um, and my son saw it as well, being a Lego game, and uh, he's already asked me I need to install it so he can play it. Um, so it's going to be a little bit different from the Lego games he's used to playing, I think. Being, uh, I think this was done in 1998 or around then, compared to the Lego games these days he plays on his on the PC and Switch. So. But, you know, if he wants to play it, more than happy to give him a shot. So, Lego Island, they even, this even has the original comic book, number one comic book inside as well. Uh, and probably two of the most expensive ones I picked up, they were only $10 to me, but when I say expensive, probably worth the most on the open market. Um, the original Fallout big box. Um, so this uh, sleeve comes off, this interplay sleeve comes off. Um, and this is 100% complete, except maybe an interplay brochure. Um, really nice copy of it. The box is in really good condition. Um, it's got the guide in there. It's got the CD in there. It's got the manuals in there. Everything. So uh, I, I know this is worth quite a bit of money on the open market. So it's always nice to um, to have to be, to be able to pick up a, co a game like this at a you know at ten dollars. Um, you know it's always nice when when things like that happen. I'll just put this sleeve back on. I'll do that in a minute. 
Uh, and the other one, obviously, to match Fallout 1, she was also selling a copy of Fallout 2. Uh, once again, uh, manual, the game, etc., are included in this. So to have Fallout 1 and 2 now, the original big box games, uh, on my Windows 98 machine, you know, it's um, you know, very nostalgic because these are the games I used to play um, when I had, you know, back in the day with my Windows 98 PC. So with my old Voodoo card cranking away in it. So, um, yeah, it was it was a nice sort of time for big box games for me. You know, there's, I, I think all up, I managed to keep about 20 odd out of the whole whole lot. A lot of them were actually empty boxes, so I'm just, I've just given those away. I don't collect empty boxes. Um, so I've given them to someone else who can use them, who has got loose games that they can put in them. Mainly war, plane, submarine type games. You know, I don't didn't really get into those when I was when I was um, you know PC gaming back in 1998. So um, they're they're better off in someone else's hands. So um, that's it for the big box PC games. What I'll show you guys now, and I'll take a bit of time to get this on the table, um, is the TI99 slash 4A bundle I got. I've had a little bit of experience with this before. I have picked up them before, but I didn't really look into them. I ended up handing them off to another computer collector, a vintage computer collector, who was looking for them at the time. So I didn't really have an interest in it, but the size of the bundle that I picked up kind of forced me to be interested in it. Um, and you know, the, what I was able to keep out of it is, um, it was actually phenomenal. The, the amount of stuff was just absolutely crazy. Uh, but anyway, I'll set it up and I'll, um, I'll show you what I'm talking about. So now we come to the last bit of the video, which is probably, which is the biggest bundle I picked up over the last two months. Actually, it's probably the biggest bundle of stuff I've picked up over the last five years. Uh, is this massive TI uh, 99 slash 4A Texas Instruments um, old PC bundle. Now I've had a couple of these before, uh, but they either didn't come with power supplies or video cables, so I just sold them off to other collectors and didn't have much to do with it. But um, I was kind of forced to get really involved in this because of all the testing I had to do once I picked this bundle up. Long story short, how I come across this bundle, essentially had a photo of a boxed uh, TI-994A, um, and, and it was basically that, uh, and just uh, um, an advertisement on Facebook Marketplace saying, old computer, uh, make an offer, come and grab it. So I made an offer of $200 for it, uh, which they accepted really quickly and said, come and get it. Now, it was about 45 minutes away from my joint, and I'd had these before, but hadn't really shown any interest. So I actually messaged back and said, look, don't worry about it. If you've got another one in line, go for it. And she messaged back saying, well, if you're into computers, you want to come and have a look what I've got. Oh, okay, right. I heard that before, got there, and you know, you usually get there, and they've got some joysticks or something there for you or whatnot. But, but you know what? Okay, right. I'll go and have a look. Glad I did, because on the way there, she sent me another couple of photos and oh my god this whole garage was full or half the garage at least was full of texas instrument stuff uh, and not only that there was a commodore pc5 in there as well a full complete commodore pc5 with the keyboard monitor uh everything it was in really really good shape so i haven't got that up here because i've now sold that to another collector of the commodore pc range um but i'll throw some photos up as i'm going along because i want to give you guys just I'll, Show you guys just the scale of how much I picked up was. It was just, it was just massive. And in the end, I paid five hundred dollars for all this because that's all I had on me at the time. She actually told me to bring some more money. She didn't tell me how much. Um, obviously, I had the two hundred for the stuff I was going to pick up originally. But I ended up grabbing five hundred dollars out the bank as soon as I saw that PC five. I went, you know what? It's going to be at least worth that. So that's that's what I'll give her for the lot. And she was happy for it. I understand why she was happy for me. Happy to take it because. I did her a huge favor by taking a lot of this stuff away. Like, and I'm not talking about, you know, a boot full. I'm talking about a whole car full of stuff. I own a RAV4. It's not the biggest SUV in the world. I had to do it over two trips. I couldn't fit it all in. Um, and when I was saying before about how much room in my garage, about pickups taking it up, well, this pretty much took up half my garage. Once I got it out of my RAV4 uh, and onto the garage floor, it was just a huge, huge bundle. And... Obviously, this come from a collector's um, stash. Uh, he passed away and his daughters were selling the house. So I was kind of conscious about if I was... Obviously, I can't keep, couldn't keep all of it. Um, but I really wanted the stuff that I couldn't keep to, to go to collectors. I, I wasn't really interested in putting the stuff on eBay. Um, obviously, I wanted to recoup my money as much as I can. Um, but I'd rather put a lower price on it, uh, knowing that collectors are going to 
going to snap it up. So I was, I was very conscious of that and where I actually advertised the stuff um, that I wanted to get rid of. So as I said, I've, I've, I've thrown a few photos up of exactly what was involved. As I said, two car loads. There was a whole bunch of Wang monitors. Um, there was boxes of TI Shug, which was an Australian TI magazine. Um, you know, they had all the old names in there, you know, the, the chairman, the CEO, you know, the editor at large, all, all the names there that, you know, if you had a TI back between the 80s and 90s, then you would have had this TI Shug magazine, you know, they had programs in there and whatnot. So uh, they ended up going to uh, a guy or a couple of guys that scan old magazines um, and upload them into different archives. So I, I didn't, didn't I, and there's no money for that, so I just gave them that. Um, there was another guy who come up, um, well, if I just explain what was involved, so there was actually two of these boxes. So he come and picked up one of these that didn't work as well as this one. Um, there was five Wang dumb terminal monitors, uh, and it was just, there was old, um, you know, thermal printers that were suitable for this. Just a lot, a lot of stuff. So needless to say, I had no issues getting my money back uh, on it, and I got to keep some really cool items. So now you've seen all the photos of, and I've explained to you how big this bundle was. Uh, you've seen the photos of the room it took up in my car, my garage, you know. Uh, and, I, and I've still managed to build a quite a nice now TI collection. I've pretty much picked the eyes out of it. And this is what I'm left with. So a full boxed cream. I know it's not the pick of the colours. Um, but he had, was it three boxed? Three boxed TIs. All up there was 12 TI computers in there. Um, I've kept the pick of the box TIs. Uh, internally to this, there's a beige TI, it's all complete. The manuals are still sealed. Power brick, um, RF cable. Uh, so whatever it comes with is, in, is now included in this box. So I wanted to keep this from a collector's point of view. Um, you always keep the best of the best. So that's why I've, I've kept this. The reason I've kept the silver one is the silver one's a little bit more sought after. Let's face it, it looks better than just a plain old cream computer. So I've kept this one, works fine, works nice, it's in really good condition. Does an aluminium case on the outside, this silver. Does have a couple of scratches down the side, but you're gonna get that with these aluminium case TIs. There's another one I have inside at the moment, it's under repair, a silver one. The couple of keys don't work on it, so I've got to pull the membrane off the keyboard, check it all and make sure there's continuity and whatnot. But um, so I will be keeping this this silver TI. This will be the one I use mainly. Um, I had I think I counted 25 cartridges, game cartridges, that I come with it. But what I found was there is what they call a final G-ROM or a final GROM cart, uh, which is essentially the same as an Ultimate 2, or not the same, but similar to an Ultimate 2 on a Commodore 64 or an EverDrive on your consoles. SD card, put your ROMs on there, plug it into the cartridge slot, and you pretty much load it up. You've got access to all the software. Uh, and all the, the games that you need, that you would have had to pay separately for, or have separate cartridges for. So I've gone down the path of having that just for space saving, you know, rather than have cartons and cartons of containers, I'd rather just have one cartridge I can put everything on. I did keep a select number of cartridges, um, particularly things like basic um, or extended basic, which is, um, it comes with standard basic on the, on the computer itself. So there's an extended basic cartridge, a couple of assemblers, uh, editor slash assemblers, disk manager, so that does all your formatting of your disks and whatnot. I can put that onto this final GROM cart, but these cartridges can be worth quite a bit, so it's nice to have the utility side of it, the gen genuine cartridges. Plus, there's also a couple of cartridges here that apparently are worth a fair bit of money. One is the demonstration cartridge, which I think either come with the silver model or this model. Uh, there's no, you can't play games or anything like that. It's just a cartridge you plug in and watch the screen. But apparently the cartridge version of it is quite rare. So um, I decided to keep the demonstration cartridge. Um, and as well as a nifty little utility cartridge, which I'm not sure um, the manufacturer of this cartridge, um, whether it was Texas Instruments or, or whatnot, but it's a diagno diagnostic cartridge, mainly well, for your PEB box. Um, it tests the cards that are inside your PE box to make sure they're working. So along with the two computers and the software, um, I also had a, a voice synth mod module. Um, what this is, is there are some games that text in it. If you don't have this plugged in, you get the text on the screen. If you have this plugged into the side of it, there's a little slot in the side, it actually reads the text to you in a human voice. 
Uh, so it's just a, an additional or an add-on feature that you can have. Um, you know, I was playing a game the other day. I initially played it and it was just text, plug this in, and you know the computer was talking to you or reading the text out to you. So quite a, quite a little rare module as well. These go for quite a bit of money. Um, and as I said, it just plugs into the side. The other thing I've got at the moment, and I may get rid of it, um, only because uh, the size and the weight of it and, and, and the stuff that I would use it for, there's modern alternatives for, which I've now got. So uh, back in the day with these, you didn't just plug a disk drive into this or you didn't plug extra memory into this or internally, you could have modded it and whatnot. But essentially to do all that, you had to have one of these, what they call PEBs or peripheral expansion boxes that goes along with it. Um, and you'll see it sits nicely with the silver, matches nicely in. Uh, 110 volt this one is initially, uh, strangely enough. I'm not sure if they're all 110 volt, um, but yeah, 110 volt. And what it is, you'll see a disk drive here. here. So that's just a floppy disk drive that you can use for it. You know, there are applications, etc., that do come on disk uh, with it. But essentially what you do is you open it up. Uh, you just pop up a couple of tabs, take the lid off. And I'll try and show you guys what is internally to it. It's quite heavy. There's, you'll see here there's a, I'm just going to drop this off the front, series of cards here. So that series of cards pretty much does all your add-ons and features that you need extra for your for your TV. Well, you don't need it, but you, you're certainly useful. So the first thing that most people did when they got this peripheral expansion box was they got the extra... The, the console itself come with 16 uh, kilobyte memory. Uh, there's a 32 kilobyte card. And when I said oh, the reason why I'll get rid of this is more modern alternatives, that's the old way of doing 32K, big box, big card. That's the, that, so that's the old way of doing That's the modern way. So the same spot that that voice synth plugs into, that's the 32K memory expansion these days. So much smaller, <laughs> much more user-friendly to have that over something like this. Uh, some of the other cards that you could get in this, um, you have a floppy controller. So to use the, you had a floppy controller card, which is what this is. So that's the card itself that plugged into one of these slots. Okay. That's it there. Oh, sorry, this is not the floppy control. This is the flexible cable card, I should say. So this card slots in the always slots in the first one, and this cable actually runs around and plugs into the side of your TI where that voice synth plugged into. That's what that plugs into. So you're, with your PEB boxes, you always needed one of these uh, flexible, they call it flexible cable interfaces. Um, so you always had to have one of those, otherwise you wouldn't have been able to plug this into your TI. The disc controller, which I was touching on before, is this one here. So this enables this floppy to connect to the main board of this. So your floppy just plugs into your floppy cable. It's just a standard floppy cable here. Plugs into this. Um, you've also got, you've got two points of connection here. You've got this one here and this one here. Um, and I think from memory you can handle up to three uh, disc modules, so, or disc drives. So um, you'll see here, this is the cable for the disc drive. It just plugs into this, this slots in, and that'll give you access to your um, floppy disk drive to be able to use with your TI. There's no programming, no setup with this. It's all just plug it in, um, and then it registers on the TI. Um, there's also two other things. So you've got your RS-232 interface. So this is what you would use if you had planned on using a printer um, with, your, with your TI-99. And then you've got this here, which I'm not 100% sure, and I haven't done enough investigating to find out what this does. Uh, a P-code card, as I said. Not 100% sure what that is, um, but um, I've got that card in there as well. And I think from a card perspective, there are a couple of extra slots in here, but from a card perspective, I'm not sure what else you could have had with the TI uh, or expansion box. Um, those five cards, obviously, are the most common. As I said, I'm not sure if there were any more cards that, that were actually needed or were utilised with the TI. Um, as I said, it's all plug and play. That power supply takes up probably a third of it. Um, and yeah, the cable just plugs into the side of that where your voice synth was. But I'm just going to wrap that up and put it back internally to this so it doesn't get damaged and run over with a lawnmower in the garage or whatnot. Um, 
Yeah, so that's that's the peripheral expansion box. And in all honesty, because I don't use a floppy, it's all cartridge based now with that final G-ROM cart. Um, I have no use for a floppy. I have no use for um, a 32K extra module because I've got the plug-in one now on the side. Um, I don't have a printer. I don't plan on doing any printing with it. I don't even know what the P-code one does. So although as neat as it is, and as much as I really want to keep this peripheral expansion box, in all reality, I'll probably get rid of it because I have no use for it and it's much better in the hands of a collector than someone who's probably going to it's going to sit on someone's garage for for the next five years and not be used. Um, some other cool things that come with was this external floppy. So um, to utilize that, you would still have to plug it in to the floppy port on the back of the peripheral expansion box. You couldn't just grab the external floppy, plug it straight into the TI. It still needs to go through this, T, uh, this peripheral expansion box. There is, you know, a spot on that uh, floppy controller card to plug that in. It also come with four extra half module um, drives. Now, interesting story. So initially this peripheral expansion box had the two drives installed, not the one. I could get the TI to, to recognize them, but I couldn't format a disc from them. So naturally, you know, no matter what I did, I had some spare floppies here, brand new floppies. I was thinking, okay, maybe the floppies are that old, they're not working. You know, I just, it just kept erroring out. Every time I used that diagnostics cartridge to try and uh, format and write something to uh, a floppy, it would just keep erroring out. And then I realized I was actually going off what the disc said, as in double, you know, it was double-sided, double density. So that was the option I was picking in the, in the menu to do the formatting and writing to. As it turns out, these floppy disk drives aren't designed to be able to read and write double-sided, double density. So I actually pulled two drives out, because I thought, oh, they're not working. Tested them with another two drives and thought, well, they're not working either. What's going on here? And it wasn't until I put this one in, I thought, wait a minute. I know I put double-sided, double density disks in, but what if I choose to format single-sided, single density disk on the options? I did that and it worked fine. Um, so I thought, hello, I've probably just pulled these ones out and thought they were faulty for absolutely no reason. So there, I will test these, so I'll have to go back, pull this one out, put these in, and it's quite easy to do. It's not a big deal. It might take a 15, 20 minute job and give them a retest. Um, I do have a lot of spare floppies here just to make sure they work as well. So. Uh, all up for $500, I would say this is just a, was a fantastic bundle. Um, and it's a, a computer that I was never looking to get into. But since I've got it now, um, and I've got, you know, all the stuff that comes with it, I actually can see me myself using this, probably more from a game perspective, but it does some pretty cool utilities as well. So um, it's always nice to have a version of an old computer whether you know whatever you come across whether it's an old Amstrad or you know if it's a good condition computer and you haven't got it in your collection you for me I might as well keep it um, you know if I don't use it you know maybe collect the dust over 18 months I don't use it I'll get rid of it that's not a problem but you know I like to have a version of each computer in um, you know in my collection or as much as I can obviously you can't have everything so but that's essentially it uh, for what I've picked up over the last two months there's been quite a lot um, hopefully I haven't bored you guys too much but um, I was just to show you guys I haven't stopped collecting or I haven't forgotten about it or I've sold my collection off and and whatnot that's not the case I've just been really really busy um, you know renovations and whatnot and work just you know being you know everyone's out of lockdown now so where I was able to make videos in between working from home you know at lunch break you go out and do something these days I can't because I'm out on the road a lot more so I'm kind of restricted as to when and where I can actually make a video so um, I do apologize for the gap in between videos, but hopefully, you know, you'll start to see them become more regular as things start to settle down at home. So that's it for the video, guys. Thanks for watching. Uh, once again, really good, well, really big thank you for, for subscribing. I, I wasn't expecting having over 500 subscribers once I come back and started looking at the figures again and statistics. So that's been quite crazy. Um, you know, and hopefully making this video just shows you haven't forgotten about it. Um, I certainly want to keep making more videos and and hopefully that'll be the case. So uh, that's it from me, guys. And until the next video, I'll, I'll see you then.